All right, so I'm going to be talking about a case that we were consulted on at the VA. And this is a this is a patient that was an inpatient over there. Um, I'll talk about his his case and, and some of the relevant pathology, and then we'll uh, I'll, I'll just kind of review some of the literature that I've found regarding other reports of, of his most likely diagnosis. Um, so this is a 67 year old male who presented with a chief complaint of nausea, weakness, and headache. Um, on further history, he said for the past several months he had had just low energy, poor appetite, and, and had been nauseated. Um, over that time period, he was an avid golfer, had been golfing every day, but got to the point that he was not able to swing a club anymore. Take that with a grain of salt, but not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, for the past three weeks, he said, in association with the other symptoms, um, he started to have a dull headache around the left eye, and it was <coughs> intermittent, came and went. Um, he had some intermittent diplopia along with that, and some actually chest pain over the same past few weeks. Um, his past medical history was uh, none. He didn't, no history of eye problems. Past medical history, um, he did have a history of coronary artery disease with some bypass surgery, he had a pacemaker placed, history of atrial fibrillation, diabetes, COPD, hypertension. Um, unfortunately, pretty common combination at the VA. Um, some medications are listed here. He's on insulin for his diabetes and some antihypertensives. And, uh, family history was not significant for any eye problems or diseases or, or for any cancers. Um, he was a long-time long -time smoker, um, many years of smoking, three-quarters pack per day currently, but history of smoking more than that. Um, no history of alcohol use, no illicit drug use. So on exam, his vision was 20-25 in the right and 20-30 in the left. Um, pupils were equal, he did not have an APD. Pressure was normal in both eyes. Motility in the right eye was full. In the left eye, he did have minus half in abduction. It's otherwise full. Um, we did find him also to have an esophoria that was worse with left gaze. And a right hyperphoria was in, in left gaze and up gaze. Um, visual fields were full. Uh, color vision was normal in both eyes. Stereo vision, he saw two out of three animals, six out of nine circles. Um, Pertel showed that he had just a slight amount of proptosis in the left eye compared to the right, just two mil millimeters. Um, on slit length exam, he was found to have some mild ptosis in the left eye, but otherwise no eyelid abnormalities. The remainder of his slit length exam, um, looking at the anterior segment, was normal. His fundus exam showed that he had uh, flat choroidal nevus. Um, in the left eye, but otherwise was normal. Um, so he had come from an outside hospital, and he had, he had mentioned these symptoms at that point, and at the outside hospital they had gotten a CT of his orbits that, that we had access to. So I'll review those. Um, so the first one, the axial view, you can see there's a pretty um, well-circumscribed mass involving the muscle belly of the left lateral rectus muscle um, appears to be sparing the, the muscle tendon. Um, here's a coronal view. You can see kind of at least at this section how much of the orbit that's taking up and um, compar comparison with the other side. And then looking at a sagittal view, you can see that it's, it's basically abutting the, the posterior edge of the globe and kind of taking up all that space between the globe and the orbital wall. Um, so based on the, the patient's history of these B symptoms and um, the CT that was obtained, <coughs> the orbits, the primary team um, decided to pursue an oncologic workup and so they, they got some more CT images. They, they just got a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis that showed some more abnormalities as you can see here. So. Um, what he's got here is a left large pleural effusion with complete collapse of the left lower lung lobe. 
Um, they also commented on multiple non-calcified pulmonary nodules in the right lung and some mediastinal adenopathy. Um, CT abdomen shows in the left kidney. This is in the inferior pole of the left kidney, but you can see this, um, this uh, increased area of enhancement that they, the radiologist commented appeared consistent with renal cell carcinoma. Um, there was no apparent uh, renal vein involvement at the time, but they did see some periaortic uh, adenopathy as well. Um, here's just a sagittal and coronal view of that same renal mass. So the differential at this point included neoplastic and non-neoplastic causes. So um, as far as thinking about the orbital lesion, most common given the, the other lesions found elsewhere on the body were metastatic disease from a, a renal cell or possibly a lung carcinoma. Other metastatic considerations would have been prostate and, and uh, metastatic melanoma. This could have been a primary orbital tumor just that happened to, to occur with the other masses, a hemangioma. Could have been a lymphoma or a sarcoma. Um, then non-neoplastic things to consider would have been a idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease, um, specifically an orbital myositis or uh, thyroid eye disease, although that would be a very atypical presentation for that. So he was taken by Dr. Patel for a biopsy of this mass. So first lateral canthotomy was, was performed. And the, the tarsal plate was disinserted laterally from the orbital rim. And then access is gained through the orbital septum and uh, blunt dissection is done basically in the space between the inferior and lateral rectus muscles until the tumor is visualized. So it's a little bit of a tight space here and, and we don't see much of what's going on deep in the orbit, but um, eventually the tumor is visualized and, and some biopsies are, are taken. Just a little glimpse here of some of the tissue that's removed. So the samples were fixed and and uh, H and E stain was obtained. This is a 40x magnification showing. Um, you can kind of just see these nests of inflammatory cells. Um, you can go closer. This is the 100x view, and you can see one of these inflammatory infiltrates. A little higher magnification. Um, 200x. You start to see that the inflammatory infiltrate, there's a lymphocyte and a plasma cell component looking at this whole area. Then 400X, you can get a little bit closer. So um, we're still, re still really just seeing inflammation, a, a lymphocytic and, and, and plasma cell inflammation that didn't look very specific and, and actually on initial read didn't look classic for, for carcinoma. Um, and so it requires some more staining to really come up with a uh, diagnosis. Um, so special stains were obtained, and this was, was found to stain strongly positive for cytokeratin-7 and vimentin. Um, a lot of other lung and, and kidney-specific stains were sent, and interestingly, none of those came back positive. But um, according to the pathologist that I talked to at, at the U that, that did these stains, 
that does not necessarily rule out <coughs> e either diagnosis. And you know, there, there can certainly be cases that don't stain positive for those. Melanoma markers were also sent and were negative. Um, because it looked so atypical for a carcinoma, um, some stains were sent to rule out a lymphoma and a plastic large cell lymphoma, and those were also negative. And so it was thought that given the combination of cytokeratin 7 and dementin positivity, most likely diagnosis is a poorly di differentiated carcinoma. Um, that still didn't tell us exactly what the primary site was, um, but given those combination of, of stains, um, renal cell carcinoma is, is known to stain positive for both of those in, in many cases. So as of last night, they, they made the lesion and said it was a tissue in the cell. Oh, did they? Yeah. Okay, good, I haven't seen that update. So, Cytokeratin 7, this is a type 2 keratin. This is not our patient's path. I was not able to get that quickly enough, but um, it's expressed in glandular epithelial cells and transitional epithelium in many organs, including the lung and the kidney. Um, it's seen in a lot of types of carcinoma, including a papillary variant of clear cell carcinoma and lung adenocarcinoma. It's not expressed by most GI malignancies. Again, this is just what a vimentin stain might look like, but not pathology from our patient. This is an intermediate filament protein that's expressed in mesenchymal cells, and it used to be thought that this was a very specific stain for sarcomas or mesenchymal cell tumors, but more recently it's been found to stain positive in a lot more types of tumors than that, including lymphoma, melanoma, and uh, some mesoderm-derived carcinomas, including renal cell, some adenocarcinomas, and thyroid. So looking at orbital metastatic disease, uh, there's, there's a good number of case series and, and reviews out there. The one that I found from Ferry and Font, this one actually, this was the biggest one that I could find that they reviewed the most cases at, at one time. This was back in the 70s, and there have been more reviews since then, but, but none of them have been even half this large. So of their review of 227 cases of, of metastatic carcinoma to the orbit and or the eye, they found that 196 of those, or 86%, had involvement just in the eye. And um, you know that's, that's consistent with our, our knowledge of um, frequent metastasis to the choroid. Um, 28 patients had involvement in just the orbit, or 12%. And 20, per, or, or 20 patients, or 8%, had involvement of both the orbit and eye. Um, there was a, a wide range of age at onset of symptoms, a mean of 52.5 years. And contrary to teaching at the time, there was no predilection for the left eye or orbit. Um, so it used to be thought that based on the anatomy of the aorta, um, metastatic disease getting to the left basically the left side or the, the left orbit would have less of a tortuous path. It, it has more of a straight shot to get there, and so you'd expect to see more disease in the left than the right. They found that was not, not the case. Um, as far as symptoms and signs that people presented with when they were found to have orbital metastasis, exophthalmos was most common, <coughs> pain, decreased vision, um, swelling around the eye, <clears throat> the number of patients had a vis visible mass and diplopia. And then looking at the sites where these tumors originated, <clears throat> the most common overall was breast. And this is, again, this is just looking in orbital metastases. This is not including the eye uh, or intraocular metastases. This is just for the orbit only. They found that breast was most common um, overall. In males, most common was lung. And then Kidney was, was a pretty big player as well. Testicular, prostate, pancreatic, um, and uh, small bowel malignancies were also found. But you'll, you'll notice too that 40% in males and 30.8% in females, they were not able to determine the primary malignancy. Um, so this is kind of just telling you what uh, when eye symptoms developed in relation to when the primary neoplasm was diagnosed. And so in just over half of these cases, 
they already had a known primary neoplastic process when they developed eye symptoms, but in almost half, the eye symptoms came on first before they detected any uh, primary source. And in a, a minority of cases, they found the cancer diagnosis at about the same time the patient developed eye symptoms. Um, so the authors commented that pulmonary metastasis was often a prerequisite, which would make sense cells are going to have to go through the venous system through the lung in order to gain access to, to the orbit. But there are, um, at least at a review that these authors had looked at, there were 15% of autopsies on patients with ocular metastasis did not show any lung lesions. Um, of course, it is possible that they just weren't, weren't large enough lung uh, lesions to, to be able to see grossly, and so they, they missed those. Prognosis. Um, for patients overall that had uh, intraocular or orbital metastasis, median survival was 7.4 months. For patients with just orbital involvement, uh, it was actually a little bit better, 15.6 months, and uh, a little bit less in patients with anterior segment uh, metastatic disease. Um, patients were followed up to 84 months was the, the last patient's last known status, and at that point, um, only 6.6 .6 were still living, and about half of those were without any other known meta metastatic disease. Um, it was unclear why there were certain primary malignancies that showed propensity to ocular orbital metastasis, like breast cancer, but others like the GI tract that, that are, are rarely seen. Um, then there was, an, uh, there's, there's several case reports and a few case series out there of discrete metastatic disease to the extraocular muscles, um, like we saw in our patient here. Um, and I, I wanted to mention just one of a series of five cases that were reported by um, Capone and others because it was so similar, I, I thought, to this patient that we had. He was a 63-year-old that presented with uh, eye irritation and eventually developed horizontal diplopia a couple weeks later had a positive tensilon test, and so was treated with pyridostigmine. But then a month later, developed uh, some subtle left proptosis, some low grade fevers and weight loss. And further imaging, um, including a CT, showed focal nodular enlargement of multiple extraocular muscles, the right medial and lateral rectus, and left, I'm gonna mention there were four extraocular muscles involved in the, in the left. Um, they obtained a workup uh, that showed also lytic lesions in the skull, um, some pulmonary nodules, and a vascular lesion of the left kidney. Um, they pursued an open skull biopsy, and, and that, that was consistent with renal cell carcinoma. Um, these are some images of, of their patient that they reported on, and you, you see pretty similar findings. You see, you see this rectus enlargement multiple spots. Um, from their literature review at the time, this was back in 1990, but there had been 31 cases reported. Um, and similar to orbital metastatic disease, when, it, when you limit it to discrete metastasis to the extraocular muscles, um, breast cancer leads, leads the pack at 51.6%. They included melanoma whereas the, um, the Ferry and Font review did not. So that was a high proportion of these as well. Lung cancer, uh, renal cell carcinoma, these were, um, these, were, these were certainly players as well, and carcinoma, neuroendocrine gastric tumors, and then there were a couple that were not specified. Um, again, there was no predilection for either orbit. Um, most of these reports were since, since the dawn of, of CT and, and since that gained widespread use. They noticed that horizontal rectus muscles are more frequently involved than vertical or obliques and um, commented that this was likely because the horizontal rectus muscles are, are a lot more appreciated on an axial CT. Rectus muscles are larger than obliques and so they're likely just seeing it a lot easier. Median survival in this group was 5.5 months but the breast cancer subgroup did better than that last, they had a median survival of 
13 months. Um, just from my own PubMed search, besides the ones that I, that, that uh, they mentioned in their case series, um, there's several other cancers that have been reported to metastasize to the extraocular muscles, including prostate, um, gastroesophageal junk, and adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, some rhabdomyosarcomas that were metastatic, pancreatic carcinoma, a neuroendocrine tumor, and a signet ring adenocarcinoma, thyroid carcinoma. Um, so thinking about workup and treatment for these patients, um, oftentimes, uh, as would make sense, if you biopsy some tissue from what's thought to be the primary lesion, compare that with tissue from the, the orbital lesion, that can help give you a specific diagnosis. Um, treatment is usually palliative because these patients are usually pretty advanced stage disease by the time they have extraocular muscle metastasis. Um, as far as treating the eye symptoms, radiotherapy can be given to the affected orbit. Um, systemic steroids can be given to reduce the side effects of the radiation. Um, if patients are having intractable orbital pain, um, and in the subset of patients that have metastatic carcinoid, um, surgery has been found to increase survival. So surgery can be considered for these patients, but often it's not done. Um, just a, a quick review on renal, car renal cell carcinoma itself. Um, 65,000 new cases and 14,000 deaths in the United States each year. There's a higher incidence in men compared to women. Um, comes on around age 64, it's the median age. 17% have metastatic disease at presentation, 17 have spread to lymph nodes, and 62% are, are localized. Five-year survival rate has actually increased in the past 60 years from 34% to 71%. Um, treatment for localized disease, uh, a radical nephrectomy is uh, often curative, and they might combine that with some adjuvant therapy. For advanced disease, it's usually unresectable. Um, if patients have a good performance status um, measured by some kind of, I'm not sure what the measurements are. If they're found to have a good performance status, interleukin-2 has been found to induce long-term remissions in about 10%. Um, for patients that are not candidates for interleukin-2 or that fail interleukin-2 therapy, um, VEGF inhibitors or mTOR inhibitors can be, uh, can be tried in these patients as well. Um, looking at ocular or orbital involvement, specifically from renal cell cancer, um, as of 2007, and there have been a few, few more cases since then, but as of then, 71 cases of renal cell metastatic to the eye or orbit had been reported, the median age of 57. Again, more common in males, a lot more strikingly so. So renal cell is 50% more common in males, but so there's, there's a high proportion of male to female spread to the orbit or, or eye. Most cases are unilateral. There are a few bilateral cases. Um, 45% had a previous history of renal cell carcinoma. Uh, duration of symptoms had a, a big range um, prior to diagnosis. And the orbit was the most frequently involved site. So, um, so as shown here, so it's, it's breaking this down into intraocular sites and extraocular sites that are listed from here down. And you'll see that the highest number of cases were in the orbit, and there were more extraocular uh, spread cases than there were intraocular. Um, there were some, some spread to some interesting places like the lacrimal gland and pump and part of the, the eyelid. Um, 18 of these patients had other concurrent metastases at the time of diagnosis. Most of them to the lung. Again, 72% were found to have lung metastasis. 50% had brain mets, 44% had bone, and 5% had liver. And yeah, one patient with liver metastasis and one with ethmoid sinus disease. Um, 31 of these patients underwent nephrectomy. 
Um, seven or 10% of these patients had radiotherapy or chemotherapy and one had embolization. As far as treating the orbital lesions, 20% or 20.6% had uh, a mass excision. 7% um, or five of the patients had a nucleation. One had an evisceration. A couple had iridectomy and quite a few, 19% had external beam radiotherapy to treat their ocular or orbital disease. Um, final outcome was known in 39 of the 71 cases. 33% were alive at that point, 67% deceased. So um, clinical course for our patient, at this point, uh, oncology <coughs> has recommended or, or brought up to the patient the idea of possible nephrectomy for cytoreduction, which he's declined. Um, he's gonna be following up with oncology this week to discuss more possible treatment options, which will likely be palliative. So to conclude, so metastatic carcinomas are a rare cause of orbital masses. Um, most common orbital metastases and discrete extraocular met metastases come from breast and lung cancers, but renal cell primary malignancy is not uncommon among these uh, metastatic lesions. Renal cell carcinoma is more common than intraocular metastasis, more, more common in the orbit than inside the eye, and treatment is most often palliative given the poor prognosis. Customary cute kid photo. Any questions? Yes. So excellent summary of a, a obviously a complicated area. But just to throw a controversy in this, uh, it turns out that there's now a, a, a fairly well accepted, although not universally accepted, concept that a renal cell carcinoma kits for both breast and prostate where you can get clearly histologically a cancerous lesion that just are quiescent, stay, don't change, and that we're gonna have people who are considered too sick to operate that have been treated on five, 10 years ago there, don't come over alive, no change. And it raises a lot of issues about how we differentiate such a thing. And it's all in this, this controversy about uh, over testing <coughs>
seeing more and more lung cancer showing up metastatically in women. And the second thing with that study is on immunoperoxidase screens, they didn't have 40 years ago, but decreased the number of those, you know, unknown tumors where they just said, okay, this is a tumor, we're not sure where it's from. Year after year, as our stain gets more and more sophisticated, we're finding that that number is really dropping down. So, hmm. like this one, even when they did a whole panel, there was still some controversy. But sure. we look at all of the stain and then say, well, okay, this is consistent with the original. So, sure. You know, in terms of, of that, like 20% that was unknown, well, that, that drops every year. What's interesting about this one is when we looked at the biopsy, there were multifocal areas of inflammatory reaction, but hidden inside those inflammatory reactions were these side cells with kind of the real stem cells that came inside mm -hmm. them, but we weren't sure what they were. And so gotcha. we sent it over to them. Those were the ones that were picking up the stain and eventually we called it in. So, so interesting specimen that it wasn't a giant mass of tumors, multifocal little discrete areas with some funny looking cells and then a bunch of inflammation. Good question. It's uh, my limited reading there there was not um, there wasn't much comment on, on any help from cytoreduction reduction by, by a nephrectomy um, that's something I'd probably have to, to run by oncology or urology and get their thoughts uh, well, talk to urology they, they've shown a willingness to get on the phone so it's just really interesting yeah. <laughs> patient's decision was a bad thing. You know, I, I don't know that, that nephrectomy would have helped. I'd have to do more reading on that. 